So it's a very special privilege to have on our program today Mr Nigel Satterley, AM, Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Satterley Property Group. Nigel, as I mentioned, pleasure having the opportunity to be able to share your background and, and your insights and your journey. I want to go back to where it all started. You grew up in a country town known as Cunderdon. Tell us a little bit about your, your family history, if you could. So my father ran a garage there, very focused on uh, customer service. He had the BP uh, drum petrol franchise, the Goodyear tyre franchise, clean heat gas, repairs. He had the only tow truck in the area. So he had the capital. So he had a long uh, or large franchise area that spanned from Northern to Meriden, uh, from Cunderdon to uh, Mora, out to Querying. So he built a great business and he was big on uh, customer service. So in seeding times, he had a roster. If a farmer blew a tyre, uh, he had the tow truck, he could go out in the middle of the night uh, and repair the tyre, uh, or not repair, but re replace the tyre. And I learned a lot about customer service. And uh, we're lucky, he sold the business in the 60s or late 60s and I shifted to Perth. At that time, the population was 360,000 Greater Perth. Today, it's two million. It's incredible. And a fairly normal sort of childhood from all reports? Very normal, a great mother and uh, father. My mother is still alive, great lady. Uh, she could manage myself and my sister. We came from a very uh, well middle class family, good family values. Everyone worked and uh, uh, traits that uh, I'll take to the grave. And tell us about your parents. What, what did they instill in you? I read that hard work and, and persistence were some of the key values that you learned, but, but what else? Tell the truth, integrity, uh, don't hide anything, do what you say you're going to do. So the early part of your life sees you growing up in country Western Australia, as you said, but then by the 1960s and following the late 60s, following the sale of your father's business, you move closer to Perth. Tell us about that period of your life, those early formative experiences in Perth. So they encouraged me to get a job. So I guess my second job was at Sutex, which was a Melbourne-based uh, great manufacturer of men's socks, jumpers, T-shirts ladies bathers, ladies stockings, ladies blouses. And that was a good learning. And by a fluke, we saw the Levi Jeans Agency distributorship for WA advertised. And at that time, there was only AMCO uh, in Australia. So I uh, applied for that and actually uh, was lucky to be awarded the distribution uh, and agency for Western Australia, which was a great start. I read that you left school at, at age 15, so your scholastic career was, was relatively short. Why was that? Did you just want to get out into the workforce? I was an average student, so if you look at my history, a very basic junior certificate, and I think you know, the school said to my mother and father that they didn't think I had the capacity to uh, you know, get a leaving certificate. So uh, I left school and I was very happy to uh, enter the workforce. And you entered the workforce, as you said before, in the rag trade. You became the Western Australia State Representative for the Levi Jeans business at age 20. How, how did that process play out? Well, they, I had a valiant car and the Levi's uh, people were just establishing in Sydney said you need to get a van, buy a van, so my parents gave me some money. I went to the ANZ Bank, who have been our house banker ever since that time, and they lent me the balance of the money to buy a van. And we didn't need a lot of working capital because what we sold for the week, the following Tuesday, Levi's would have the replacement stock and the commission check. So away we went, we're very lucky, good cash flow, and uh, we ran a very good business. Reflecting on this time years later, you said, I worked all hours and knew the harder I worked, the more money I could earn. Not not before long, I was the state's top Levi sales rep and outsold every other jean retailer. How, how did you go about that? Was it just that you were providing better customer service than everybody else? Better customer service. So if you were Rob's menswear in Fremantle and rang up at 5 to 12 on Friday for a special order, uh, the AMCO agents would tell you to get stuffed, ring back on Monday, and we just saw a great opportunity uh, that we'd run the special orders to the station uh, to the bus 
and then we had a young guy working in our store and every Saturday we'd do the stock take and about two o'clock he would leave and he would do all the hand deliveries down into the Fremantle area. We had about seven different menswear stores. So the service just overcome, we're good people and I think a better product. And Walsh's, which was, uh, if you sold to Walsh's, he sold to, uh, he, you know, made it very easy. So we designed a credit arrangement that suited Walsh's and they were just a huge uh, uh, retailer for us. And of course, every other menswear store in Western Australia wanted Levi jeans. So we're now at the late part of the, the, the 1960s. I believe it's 1968 where you, when you purchase your first property using the commissions from your Levi days and you purchased a block of land near Morley in 1968 and you flipped it 10 months later for a $10,000 profit. What gave you the, the foresight to invest rather than spend that money given you're only 21? Uh, I think I had an interest in real estate and had bought and sold a few blocks of land and this came up and I guess everything you have a bit of luck. I thought it was cheap it turned out to be a, a super good deal and a very astute Jewish man bought the, uh, bought the property from us so I was very happy and that was a you know, great starter. So a $10,000 profit in those days was equivalent to, you know, like three homes in the growth areas. So then next came a fortuitous meeting with two businessmen who would go on to play a major part in your life in BF Prindeville and Sir James McCusker, the later of whom was the founder of Town and Country Building Society. How did, you, how did those meetings come about and, and what impact have they had on you? So I met Sir James McCusker and they were starting off the Town and Country Building Society which came Town and Country Bank. And he said to me one day, uh, you know, why are you dealing in all this rubbish? You know, jeans, it should be in the property business. And I said, Jim, I said, these jeans are selling like hotcakes. I'm thinking about opening a, a Levi's jeans store in the city because these are selling so well. He said, you're silly. So he kept at me and about 12 months later, I asked Levi's, could I sell the franchise? Uh, and they had to approve the price, they were a bit reluctant, and also the incoming party. And then I started a company called Statesman Homes, uh, which I was helped by uh, uh, you know, Jim McCusker, Sir James McCusker, and the ANZ Bank funding our display homes. Running a building company, you need very little capital. We're capital-like businesses. And uh, Bernie Prenable was a, a director of the Town and Country organisation and I got a, struck a very good friendship with him and uh, he gave me some very good advice and assisted me and uh, he was the godfather of, of business. Each, as you know, each city, capital city, has a godfather and he was the godfather of the Catholic Church in Australia and the godfather of the Perth uh, business community. So it's 1970 and you start Statesman Homes, as you said, with $25,000 in capital. What, what happened next? So we, uh, after about three years, we became the main uh, builder, doing 50 starts a month. Um, in 1974, we turned over 20 million, which was a lot of money, and made a profit of eight, pre-tax profit of 800,000. I said to myself, how good is that? So then we were making generally a margin uh, after maintenance and warranties of two and a half to three percent on turnover. But you paid the subcontractors halfway through the month or at the end of the month, and then the suppliers, you pay at the end of the month plus 45 days. So you have a huge amount of free cash flow using the creditors' uh, money. So when you look at the building companies, uh, balance sheets, uh, yeah, the, the amount of creditors there is massive. And so that gives you the, the cash flow for show homes and for other things. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I also think in the same year in 1974, the biggest listed builder in Perth went bust. That was, the land or homes went bust. So that was uh, in two ways for us very good because it took a big competitor and then there were a couple of other builders that eased back a bit. Uh, we, we, we were lucky to take part of that business, so we would find uh, immigrants a job. They'd come in and then, of course, once they had the job, we'd in a position to sell them a new home. And a lot of those uh, spec homes were funded by uh, Town & Country, 
uh, and also by the ANZ Bank. So we're very lucky that they, they, they trusted us. We didn't have a big capital base, but they uh, knew that we could sell the homes and repay the bank. And then just in terms of the growth of Statesman's Homes, so it launches in 1970, by 1975, 1976, you're doing between four to 600 completions uh, per year. How did you manage that level of growth? Uh, just by having good systems. So we designed an Olivetti costing uh, system. So every Monday I'd go through any overruns. So it was the best we could do. And of course, from the 80s, you've seen magnificent uh, systems that the builders use now and we worked it out very quickly doing 40 to 50 starts a month worked doing 60 there was too much stress in the operations so we kept out knowing what we could do through the heady times and the softer times so 40 to 50 starts a month was really the optimum number for us where was the demand being driven from at that time? Was it interstate migrants? Was it local growth in population? No, mainly, mainly immigrants from uh, United Kingdom. Australia has, uh, or Western Australia, then clearly I would think 80% of the immigrants were from the United Kingdom and then from New Zealand and then the growth of uh, the population. But the immigrants uh, were the biggest uh, customers. Nine years after launch in 1979, you decide that you want to move on from the business and you end up finding a, finding a, a buyer for the business. What, what prompted the move to want to move out of Statesman Homes and, and into something else? I think I, I thought maybe housing would become, you know, unions would get involved. Uh, I didn't want to be involved or subject to that union pressure. And what I was thinking about, I was approached by two people. Do you, would you like to sell your building company? Uh, one person I wouldn't have sold it to. Uh, the other person was Len Buckridge. And we had a meeting, uh, we, he asked questions which I was able to answer in about a week. You know, you know, what was the work in progress, the warranties, uh, houses to start, ins and outs, roughly what I wanted. So we went back to him and uh, about a week later he came back and said, I'd like to, uh, uh, by the business. Uh, he knew that Malcolm Akuska was very close to me. He said, get Malcolm to draw up heads of agreement uh, and uh, then we'll uh, make the, the transaction. And I said, Len, just confirm me, we, we want settlement on the 30th of June, 1980. That was fine with him. So Statesman really led him to become the biggest uh, builder in Australia, or home builder, and built the great integration so uh, he knew that he's a capitalite business. If you're a good manager, you've got a huge free cash flow. We've explored your background and indeed the, the early part of your business career. I want to now unpack the establishment and growth of Satterley Property Group, the business you founded in 1980 and have built into Australia's largest private residential property developer. Take me through the launch of Satterley Property Group. What was the initial vision? The initial vision was really to do some property development and be a general agent. So I didn't realise until the first year, you know, when you got commission checks in 1980 selling a building for four million, you get 80,000, oh, how good's this, you know? Uh, a briefcase and a car and an office. So then came a huge downturn. So the financiers knew that I had a building background. So they got us to finish townhouse developments small office things, a lot of things that were collapsing. So that was terrific. And then in 1982, I said to uh, Sir James McCusker, we should, you know, you should look town and country going into land development to, as well as you know, being a lender. Uh, he said to me, that's a great idea. Uh, he was the chairman of the Whitford Development Corporation. So he really liked the land development. And he said, this is a great opportunity. We're having a period where the discharges are larger than lending in the period, and we've got lots of cash, and we need to broaden our base so we can lend more money. So we then developed uh, the, you know, the town and country uh, land, and they were by far in the 80s, from 82 to when he sold to the ANZ Bank in 91. They were by far the largest land developer. 
so I didn't have the capital and what he said, Nigel, we'll have a fair deal. Uh, you bring all the deals to me, Town & Country Bank, uh, you do the delivery and the selling uh, and uh, I don't want you uh, dealing in land, I don't want you taking land to other people. So that turned out to be terrific for them and for us, huge profit maker for the bank. And then when he sold to the ANZ Bank, he said, now, you, you know, you can have a bit of equity and things with us. So we kept going. And then Sir James passed away in uh, September 95. And Malcolm said to me that, you know, he's my, uh, Malcolm's main uh, reason in life is the law. He said, I don't want to do any massive land developments and you should you know, start finding other people to do it. I'll be part of it, but I don't want to be uh, you know, the major shareholder because law is my love. And he, as you know, is an outstanding uh, legal mind. So then we had to change the model. I went to the Home Building Society and the board said, we'd love to be in this. So then we expanded uh, to you know, the wealthy families, the small institutions. Uh, and we're built up from there. So there's about 200 uh, investors who invest with us uh, and see you know, land development as a pretty safe product. You can't double your money overnight, but you can make good returns. Despite the economic headwinds in the 1980s and, and to some extent 1990s, your business kept growing, the Satterley Property Group business kept growing, but quite a lot of developers were, were going under. What were some of the pitfalls that you saw that others were making? Were they getting too greedy? Were they developing in the wrong areas? So the banks used to call me the real estate doctor. So you go in there, people were too greedy. Greed was the main collapse or overpaying. So the 90s produced unbelievable opportunities for us uh, for which the town country bank could purchase. So we made unbelievably good purchases. Uh, Hooker uh, got into trouble, Hooker Rex. Um, you had uh, the Merchant Bank uh, in, in Melbourne uh, got into trouble. Uh, uh, you had Parry Corporation, we bought all that land in Hall's Head uh, from, the, from the bankers. So, so I had to convince Sir James McCusker to buy all this land for about 16 million. Uh, and a year later, we had re sold enough to c recover the 16 million, and he was left with five and a half thousand blocks at zero cost at 800 square metres each. So if you worked it out today, the 100,000 a block. Uh, so you know, deals like that were pretty special. Correct me if I'm wrong, the first project of scale, of significant scale, was 45 hectares in Leeming, which you purchased for about 3.5 million. Correct, you're very good. <laughs> what happened next after that? So then we went, we, after that the government approached us to do a couple of joint ventures uh, with them, uh, Alexander Heights and at uh, Naranda through there, and then uh, we purchased land at Murdoch, uh, we purchased land in uh, out in uh, uh, Butler and uh, Hallshead Meadow Springs. So, one of the things that I found interesting was your approach to risk management and your strategy, wherein you said low gearing, well managed projects, acquisition of opportunities in a sensible way, regardless of market conditions. Has that philosophy stood fast over the the past 35, 40 years? Yes. So, what I learned from Sir James McCusker is how you manage risk and that has been the key to success. And you don't be too greedy, and he used to use the word, Nigel, tell me how long it's going to take to get the bait back on the back of the boat. So that meant, what did you have to sell to make the thing risk-free? And those formulas that we worked out in the early 80s, we still use today. In a market as cyclical as Western Australia, how have you been able to navigate the times where the market's been particularly hot, but also the, the times in which the market's been down and out? How do you remain level and stable as a business? It's the level of debt. Uh, and we gear you know, usually uh, uh, around about 40%. So the banks will let us go to 55. So if we can sit in that band of 35 to 40%, we've got good headroom, we know what we need to sell to break even. Uh, you know, we're on a very good rates with the banks. So we're on you know, the BBSY plus you know, 2.65, 2.8 for vacant land. Uh, 
is a pretty good margin. And now it's double that because of, you know, the interest rates have gone up. So it's a matter of many, knowing what the break even is. As you know, land tax is a big impost, somewhere about 1% of the real value. So if you have an asset for 100 million, the land tax payment is 1 million a year. Plus you've got you know, rates and taxes, interest payments. You've developed now over 180 of these master planned communities, but where did the inspiration for wanting to build master planned communities come from as opposed to just doing large scale land subdivision? You've always been very passionate about having the lifestyle and the amenity. Where's, where's that been driven from? Really from my country up uh, bringing and people who buy from us, let's say 85% of our buyers, when they buy a house and land package, they're giving us all the money they've got, all their hard earned money. So if we can create a place where the, the women are happy, great playgrounds, the kids are happy, dad comes home from work, it's a happy house. And as you, you know, happy wife, happy life. And now in the last 10 years, we've seen a real involvement of the grandparents shifting out to help with the grandchildren, mum and dad work. So creating real communities, establishing the play group, the sporting clubs, uh, the coffee and cake mornings, all that is, you know, I think we're the only ones in Australia who have the in-house expertise. So we were the first to do destination playgrounds and now we're seeing these great playgrounds being uh, done by our competitors and us. So, you know, the community is the winner. As we move into the 2000s, along comes geographic expansion for the business, in particular into Victoria and into Queensland. What prompted that decision? Because as the business got bigger, it's called managing the risk. So if people have invested, say, 100 million and say, six projects in Perth, uh, that's plenty for their balance sheet. So they said to us, you should look at other places and as you know, Melbourne's the biggest greenfield market. We went to Queensland first, and uh, that's the second biggest market. And uh, people are happy now that they can invest with us. And we have offerings uh, in Queensland, especially South East Queensland, Melbourne, and in uh, Perth. How different are those three markets, or are the fundamentals pretty consistent? Fundamentals are pretty consistent. Perth is the cheapest at about 600 dollars a square metre for land. Melbourne is $1,000 a square metre. Uh, Queensland's nine seventy five dollars a square metre. So now we're in a downturn. Uh, Melbourne market is running at about 50% of real demand. Uh, Queensland's come off about 40%, Perth's off about 60%. I want to unpack that risk management a little bit more. What are the key inputs that you look at prior to deploying capital from a, from a risk perspective? So we have to look at the location, what our competitors are paid for the land, uh, how far from the employment areas, what is the amenity. Uh, education now is a big thing. The safety, the roads, they are the, the main thing. So you have to look at what you need to generate a return, and what is your break even, what's the competitors. And today, the Australian banks have got great technical people, great data, great risk people, and we all became a lot more, we we're all a lot more sophisticated today. So all of that information is very important. Before we move on, with regard to your approach, you've previously said I'm likely the only property CEO in Australia who goes out to their sites and I believe that you often visit some of your major projects or indeed all of your projects up to 20 times a year. How effective has that approach been for you and the team? That is, is amazing because uh, usually it's a Saturday morning so I'll go to the biggest selling estates uh, which are some of ours, our competitors, to see the building signs who's you know, really doing the business. And then from about 12.30, I go to the show homes. And most of the sales people are glad to see me. They talk to me. I want to know how good our service is, what people are saying about our products. It's just a great feedback. And you can, you know, you can call it the trigger boff factor of knowing what the customers want and being there. And I'm the only CEO who actually goes to the sites talks to all the salespeople. I'm lucky, Perth people know who I am, Melbourne 
more people know and they come and talk to me because they're considering their, where they put their life savings. The business has now been operating continuously for 42 years. What have been the biggest challenges along the journey? I think the biggest challenge was really for us that period in Western Australia leading up to COVID. It was tough and our industry was you know, heading for very difficult times. So that's been the most difficult. I think the next say 18 months are going to be challenging uh, of how you navigate through the storm uh, of the higher interest rates, cost of living, the, the petrol prices. Uh, so far, everyone's confident about their jobs. But I think in the Eastern Australia, you're going to see the prices come off. You're going to see unemployment go up. And they're all the challenges that we have to deal with. But I think the medium term with immigration is very, very good. And I think what we're now saying to our Premier here and to the Prime Minister, we've got to move to, to get trades in here because I think when the Ukraine war finishes, they're going to be serious competition for Europe trades to go to there for many, many years at high prices to rebuild Ukraine. So we're going to move quickly to get skilled infrastructure, building workers in here. Keys for success in property development, what are they? Well, you know, buying in the right location, being well capitalised, not over gearing, have accurate numbers, very accurate numbers. And what we've seen in the last, say, 12 months, civil cost landscaping have gone up around 25%. I think for the balance of the financial year, they'll go up at 1%. And for people like us, you know, say the all-up cost of funds were 3%, today to 6%. That's amazing cost increases, plus you have a no price growth escalation and you have the sales rates halving. So they're, you know, they're uh, all of what's ahead of us. What guides your thinking with regard to doubling down on a singular asset class as opposed to moving into, say, the industrial property sector or the commercial property sector or the retail property sector? What's led you to, to remaining simply in the, in the residential sector? So over the time, you know, where we started was land development. We have very deep expertise, but we've also done neighbourhood shopping centres, uh, daycare, uh, bulky goods. And a lot of our uh, investor partners are saying we should develop those and keep those. So we're looking at doing more of that. We have done uh, in the past some uh, industrial land subdivisions. And in Melbourne, uh, we look like acquiring a site where we'll do industrial land subdivisions where we can offer a, a turnkey operation or just sell the land. As you know, Melbourne's now the logistics capital of Australia. Is that the long-term future of the business, do you think, moving into various asset classes to, to diversify? Yes, and I think our investors are asking us for reoccurring income and uh, we have uh, been successful in those asset classes. So we will do more of that. And as you know, on these big sites in the end, the land, you're getting the land for next to nothing because you, you're trading. If you sell the site for 25 million, uh, you pay 40% in tax. Uh, you might as well uh, have the asset there forever. Before we move on, what keeps you coming to work every day? You, you clearly don't have to, but what keeps you motivated and inspired to? Oh, the challenge. This is a very competitive, very challenging industry. I'm very young compared to Triggerboff, Frank Lowe, the, the great legends of our industry. So, you know, I, I will die working and I uh, enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, we have a lot of fun. We've got good people we work with and we, you know, I'm not that bright, but I always have the philosophy, I only want to deal with people I like and trust. And that's really been the philosophy throughout. How important are people to an organisation? Uh, very important. And I mean, land development with our structure is easy to build the lots. So in the bankers, the two questions for the bankers, or three, are the location, run us through the approval process. That's the biggest risk. How are you going to get the development approval and how accurate are the inputs from the costs? Let's close out our discussion with a few more general interest topics. How would you define your management or leadership philosophy? is very open and I will do anything that I would ask uh, 
our team to do. So whatever we need to do, whatever it takes, I will do the same as I would expect our team to do. You've now been in business for over half a century. What are the, the key lessons that you can share that you've learned? The integrity, the honesty, doing what you say you're going to do, and the long-term relationships are most important. As I understand it, you've also been involved in the West Coast Eagles AFL Football Club since around about 1986. Talk to us about how your involvement came along and, and some of the ups and downs that you've experienced. So the football club, uh, there was a group of people who thought, if you're a West Australian, somehow we want to beat the fix at football and cricket. So they thought we'd talk to the VFL then for a licence to enter the VFL. So we looked at raising 12 million, the business plan. I went to Robert Holmes Accord, I was one of the founding fathers, and asked him, he, he said, Nigel, you know, tell these young guys if they can raise 8 million, they'll be geniuses. He wrote a check for, uh, from the West Australian for $500,000. So we got to 7 million, we had to take the hat around and around, we fell over the line at 8 million. So in November, uh, the agreement was, I think it was five and a half million uh, fee to join the, uh, the AFL. So we paid the one and a half million and then we had to pay a million a year. Uh, and of course in January it's well known that Ross Oakley demanded we pay all the money or he wouldn't issue the licence. So we paid all the money and about one and a half years in the club we had six weeks uh, money left. So we had to, you know, meeting with then Premier Dowding, Peter Dowding, a great fellow, and he said, Nigel, you know, football's had too much money, you, you can't beat the Vicks, you're not going too well, you've had bad coaches, looks like you've got bad management. And uh, my father's a rabid Reverend Dowding, Collingwood supporter. So at any rate, over the next couple of weeks, we worked with the then Treasurer, Joe Berenson, who said we'll help on the basis we're going to get the money back, which is very appropriate, and that's how the Football Commission started. So today, West Coast have got investments, assets, cash of 200 million, four premierships, and we are now you know, uh, the biggest membership. So we had rocky start, learnt a lot, and uh, you know, Michael Malthouse uh, helped turn uh, West Coast around. And what I always tell uh, chairmen of football clubs, the coach drives the membership and the culture. How rewarding has it been for you to be involved in the club from the very beginning and to see that success? Oh, very rewarding and people love the football club. So yeah, we want to be responsible, uh, you know, develop a good football uh, team and of course now it goes deep into the community which is terrific to help people. So it's a serious club. Business and sport, what are the correlations that you see between both of them? Well, if a football club doesn't have a good board, it doesn't have a good CEO and a good football department, it's unsuccessful. So we have watched the Dockers and it's taken them 20 or 22 years to get the formula right. And, and you know, the Dockers now are really on the right track. They're in the zone. Uh, we've watched Melbourne struggle, we've watched North Melbourne, uh, what St Kilda have done is amazing, you know, like they had a coach and they gave him a contract and uh, then sacked him. So all of those things, uh, it's, it's a business, it's a high cost, low margin business. How have you seen Australia's business landscape change over the years? I think it's a lot more conservative. So when I started out, you had you know, John Elliott, uh, Spelvins, uh, you had the fellow who took over Channel 7, um, a number of people, most of them Alan Bond, uh, Holmes of Court. Holmes of Court was very sophisticated. So if you have a look at the ones that when I started out that I left, you know, Kerry Stokes, great success. Um, there's not a lot of them. A lot of them have passed, but you know, Stokes has kept going strongly. Uh, uh, there's not too many, but you know, Harry Triggerboff, uh, you know, the Lowys have kept, kept moving. 
You mentioned the population of Perth, which was 360,000, I think you said in the late 60s, now just a smidge under 2 million. How have you seen the, the Perth business landscape, but also the state of Western Australia evolve? Uh, I think most people still think it's a big country town from the east, so it's good that people like you come to Perth. It's good when the senior bankers, we encourage them to come to Perth to see their, their clients. I mean, Western Australia is doing 50% of Australia's exports. So our exports this year will be 250 billion, 240 billion last year. So, you know, 10% of the population are carrying the economic fortunes of Australia. And this is why the Premier did such a good job in COVID, keeping us safe, keeping all these resource uh, organisations moving and exporting. Let's talk about politics because you've been involved in politics for many years now. Firstly, at a national level, how have you seen the political landscape change over the past, say, 30 or 40 years and what do you think of the current crop of leadership? I think the if you look at the Liberal Party uh, at federal level, this would be the weakest Liberal team we've ever seen. Uh, Labor have had issues, but I think Labor now, if you line up their best 15 against them, Liberal 15 in the Parliament, uh, there's a huge difference. So Labor have learnt a lot of lessons from the past. I think they're now trying to govern in the middle lane. Uh, Prime Minister Albanese has been terrific at mending a lot of those relationships uh, that are important to Australia. And I think, you know, the Liberal Party uh, in Western Australia, in, in uh, uh, Victoria and in Queensland in most areas needs to put a wire brush through it and start from scratch and get the right people and the voters don't like the uh, what goes on you know these offbeat religion groups taking over controlling the party which doesn't send a good message. And what's been the the cause of that is you know the Liberal Party over here was decimated down to two seats in the parliament is that something that's happened over the, the last couple of years or has this been a trend over a decade or so? Oh, it's been a trend, a serious trend since 2017 when we, I tried to tell them they're, gonna, they're in serious trouble, no one listened and uh, it's been happening for 10 years. So when you have four major election failures, you know, nothing's changed. And we, if we, make a, we have a failure, we learn by our mistake and we correct it. What about the future of Perth? How are you seeing the, the growth of the capital over the next, say, 10 or 20 years? How's that going to play out? Are you, are you seeing the investment and the capital and the resources being deployed? So if you have what the Eastern states and what the Asians say, we're a big mining town, Perth now, and we're a major medical town, very lucky. But there's not the diversity here. We've got to diversify our employment base. So all the smart kids leave, if you're not in the resource or medical, go to Melbourne or Sydney, London or New York, and then a lot of things to parents are now leaving. So what we've seen is a lot of expats return, a lot of the smart kids leave, so we're only growing at about 16,000. Now the Premier's fully aware we've got to be growing a minimum of 35,000 and then up to 50,000. So to grow at 35,000, we've got to be able to attract at least 20,000 of the immigrants that are coming in. And I think we're very lucky that the Premier and Minister Ellery are looking at all the strategies that we can at least get 20% of the international immigrants in here to meet the mass skill shortages in the resource sector and in general. And from that, we can have a much more diverse economic base have education uh, accommodation in the city, education universities in the city. So all this is ahead of us. So unless we can get the population to 35,000, Perth's going nowhere. Where Melbourne will grow at 140,000, you know, Sydney at 80, you know, Queensland at 90,000. We've somehow have got to get our base increased to at least 35, then to 50. At a national level, what do you see as the future growth industries or opportunities for Australia and inversely, what are some of the, the long-term challenges on the horizon, do you think? So the long-term, the long term, you look at long-term, is how we can improve the manufacturing base. So we're going to be more 
diverse in medical, uh, in commerce, in IT, uh, smarter at manufacturing, you know, doing more uh, you know, with a lithium built, doing batteries here, doing more of those value add in Australia. And how do you, how did we bridge those, uh, those, you know, used to be called the tyranny of distance as you know, but how do you bridge those, uh, the gap into Asia or into China? How do we build the networks? So the, it's got to be government led. So the first thing now that the Victorian elections are finished, you know, Daniel Andrews is by far the most powerful and most respected Australian politician in China, where they think he's the king of Australia or the prime minister. So he, he and I believe, and hopefully he will do this, and brace that with Penny Wong and also Julie Bishop, uh, is very uh, well regarded in China, that they uh, can get up there and mend the bridges so that our relationship with our great customer is fair, it's commercially fair, it's respectable, and the Prime Minister knows this. And you know, I think Premier Andrews uh, will be the man that can really, I use the word, move that along in the right uh, place. You've got an incredible network of contacts from right across Australia and, and indeed the, the world. Who have been the two or three most impressive people that you've met in your career? Oh, look, in my career, very impressive people. Sir James McCusker, uh, his son Malcolm, keep it simple, can work it out very, very uh, quickly. I've been around them a long time. Um, there's been, uh, so uh, Richard Pratt, who I was very fond of, uh, you know, he, he could work things out very, very uh, quickly. Uh, Kerry Stokes is you know, streetwise, smart, can work things out very quickly. If he doesn't know, he can find out quick. A fellow who helped our football club, who's now passed, Bob Hammond, who was a big grocer in South Australia, and he helped us fight the VFL and uh, the AFL, uh, keep things even. So there's, th th those are the types of people. You and your wife Denise give a lot of your time and your resources to charitable causes, donating millions back into the community, including through Telethon 7, through My Rooms uh, Children's Cancer and Maddie Rewalt's Vision, to name a few. Why is this aspect of your life so important to you? Well, we're lucky that people who bought our products have helped us uh, uh, build a business. So we want to do things that make help people who buy our products, right? And I think helping children, uh, we're you know, helping, we've won the uh, Prince Philip Award for training of people apprenticeships. So where we can make a difference and where the charity doesn't have you know, these commission payments to fundraisers, that's where we uh, you know, place our money. And we look at Telethon, for instance, they have now have 97 beneficiaries and smart people who look at all these things say, how good is the selection of these? So when you give, say, $1,000 or a child gives $50, every cent goes to a cause where Seven and the Stokeses pay all the cost administration. And they're the types of things that people want to give the money to. The governance is good. And uh, you know, they are now the benchmark of philanthropy. So let's take a deep dive into the current market conditions. What's your reading on the, the current state of play? We're at the conclusion basically of 2022. What are the key themes that are emerging? I think you know, people being scared by the fast rising uh, interest rates, fast rising inflation, and of course, cost of living. No one has seen the way that goods have gone up on the family budget, and of course, once house prices start to correct downwards, that makes the consumer even more conservative. So what we're already knowing that the banks are well equipped, very skilled to help good people through these times. And at this time, no one is worried about their job. And there's lots of jobs, you know, Coles, Woolworths, other retail outlets, doctors' surgeries, offices. There's plenty of part-time work for people's partners to be able to pick up, say, three days a week, an extra $600 a week for the family. So we're seeing you know, this type of thing happening and people are just holding back because they don't know how it's all going to finish up. 
and I think you know the stormy clouds are well and truly in front of us. Cost of construction up between 30 to 40 percent and also meaning that uh, a lot of the homes are 50 to 60 percent delayed um, from what I read earlier. What, what, how are you seeing that? So people are asking, gee the house is going to take it you know a year and a half or 15 months to build used to take seven months will the builder be able to complete my home and then of course at the first of uh, July 2020 a popular home in Melbourne was 250 today it's 350 and most probably going up at one percent a month for the next uh, to the end of the financial year so all these things just make people a bit nervous and you know these building companies as you have seen are capital light -like businesses they run on cash flow and of course when you can't get timber frames or roofs and things, uh, the cash flow slows down, and the creditors want to be paid, and then when you have the issues. Supply chain, you're still sensing that there's a squeeze or is that yes. stabilised? So Perth is the worst for skilled labour and for supply chain. So in actual fact, we're now telling the contractors, you know, pipes and things, blocks, they're in short supply, uh, store them, and we have an invoice and uh, we will pay for these to try and speed up our production. But Perth is the slowest, we work in the best conditions and we've got the slowest civil uh, construction programs. Conversations that you've had with banks, nervousness or are they still relatively confident? The banks are conservative and I think the banks are, with housing loans, they're going to have a a careful outlook. They know Australia has a bright future, but maybe the next 15 months there is a lot of uncertainty and the banks are well equipped. Uh, we're lucky we have a very good banking system in Australia to look after good credit worthy people and they'll get them through. The low deposit people, the banks are well equipped to help them. In terms of the political landscape, some of the big issues at the moment is multi-employer bargaining and then the recent IR laws. Do you foresee either of those or anything else on the horizon having a major impact? We don't, but we just hope, like the civil industry is separated from that, but the resource sector, which is the backbone of Australia, run by some very, very good people. And I, just, I think the Prime Minister will be very open, uh, Minister Burke, that it's got to be fair for everyone so that we don't find the resource sector uh, slowing down, having you know, rising unemployment, all of that. So these are the times ahead of us. There's some very sensible people from the business community, the leaders to work with, you know, the Prime Minister so far. To me, he's following from the McGowan playbook, the great success, and McGowan was following the great Prime Minister and Bob Hawke. So we just hope sensible times are ahead. What are the benefits of being a private business in this sort of environment or in a business context in general as opposed to some of your other competitors who are on the public markets? So we don't need to be a public company to uh, raise capital. Uh, we don't need to cut prices heavily to pay executive bonus or try and keep the share prices up. So you know, we've had projects that were making 22% internal rate of return. Uh, a difficult period comes in the IRR drops down to 18. None of our partners are worried because the profit per lot is good. They're very good projects and we haven't had to discount things to try and keep share prices up. You know, uh, creative accounting for executive bonuses that have been well publicised uh, in our industry. Are you having to do or are you setting the business up in a different manner for next year than you did at the start of this year in any way or are you pushing ahead as planned? Pushing ahead and you, you have to be very cost conscious. The cost of doing business, no wastage in your uh, operations and just a bit more prudent. So we're just watching the costs, um, making sure we're not wasting uh, money and we're doing what we need to do to sell blocks and look after the purchases. Still bullish on the acquisition opportunities if they come up next year? That yes, so we have a substantial war chest uh, for, for things. So uh, history would say along the way, we never know when, when they come up, which is interesting, but we're well equipped for when they do come up. My final question, 
When you reflect on your career, there's been so many moments and so many challenges, so many opportunities that you've taken. What's left that you still want to achieve? I'd like to, you know, there's more to do with our business. There's lots of things that we can control and do better within our business. I just you know, keep trying to be successful, putting back into the community and being respected. Nigel Sadley, AM, absolute pleasure catching up with you. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks very much, Rob. Thank you.